We recently posted some videos to YouTube, including a podcast with Rachel Crawford on the pro-choice slogan, consent to sex is in consent to pregnancy. We also released a clip from that podcast summarizing the responsibility objection, calling the video one of the biggest flaws with the violinist argument. We've received a few interesting comments and questions from those videos that I've responded to in writing, but wanted to make this video to do so more publicly and hopefully take the discussion to a deeper level. As a quick review, in case you haven't seen those, the responsibility objection is a pro-life argument that responds to bodily rights arguments like the kind that we see in Judith Jarvis Thompson's essay in defense of abortion, where you've got like the famous violinist thought experiment. And the responsibility objection says that when you have consensual sex, you're engaging in an act that you know might result in the creation of an inherently needy child that you now owe compensation to. I think this is a good argument. I think it is worth bringing up. I think it doesn't apply to the case of rape, so it's not going to help pro-life people there. But I think this can be helpful to the discussion, though, because part of the problem with the violinist argument is that it is typically used by pro-choice people to defend all abortions, not only abortion in the case of rape. And so in that case, one of the disanalogies worth pointing out is that in the violinist argument, you were kidnapped and hooked up to this other person. And that's not how pregnancies that result from consensual sex begin. And that is a disanalogy. And so that's where we would bring up the responsibility objection. It is not this slam dunk silver bullet argument that is going to respond to all abortions or should be like the only thing in pro-life people's toolbox. But I do think it is one of the helpful arguments to make early on in a discussion about, for example, the violinist argument. My friend and Christian apologist Tim Hole posted the consent to sex video in a group and he saw this response that I'm going to read in full. There's a massive flaw with the responsibility objection, which is that it isn't the real reason why anti-abortionists like Josh Brom oppose abortion. And this is the very point that Judith Jarvis Thompson makes in her defense of abortion paper. So the argument goes, anti-abortionist. Women shouldn't be allowed to terminate a pregnancy because they agree to have sex knowing that it might create a baby, so they must accept responsibility for the life they've created. Pro-choice. So does that mean that women who are pregnant, and then I added from rape in brackets because I think that's what he means, but that's not in the original. So just so you know, I added from rape because I think those are critical words that he just forgot to write when he was writing this. So again, he says, I believe. So does that mean that women who are pregnant from rape should be allowed to have abortions because they bear no responsibility for the pregnancy? And then the anti-abortionist says, oh no, they shouldn't be allowed to have abortions either. And so then he goes on to say, the responsibility objection is a red herring. When the objection is removed, there is still another objection, the real objection, underneath it which is unaffected by the responsibility objection. This is like if Mary wants to buy a dog and her housemate Amy doesn't like dogs. So Amy says, we can't have a dog. The lease says we can't own pets. And then Mary says, I've spoken to the owner and she's agreed to take that clause out of the lease. So then Amy has to say, okay, we still can't have a dog because I hate them and I'm never going to have one live with me. He or she, I don't know which, says Amy should have raised her dog hatred in the first place because this was always going to be the deal breaker whenever the lease said. By the way, I like that thought experiment a lot. I think it actually does a really clear job of explaining the problem that he's trying to point out. He finally says, I wish that anti-abortionists would deal with their real non-negotiable reasons for opposing abortion and not try to deflect the argument by referring to something which when push comes to shove, doesn't affect their view. Okay, so those are interesting thoughts, and I think there's some common ground here. I agree that pro-life people shouldn't be making arguments if they are actual, like, red herrings, if they're not, you know, a primary reason why we're opposed to abortion or something like that. So, is the responsibility objection a red herring? First, there are multiple problems with elective abortion. The responsibility objection demonstrates one of them, but not all of them. We're allowed to have parallel arguments, just like they're allowed to support abortion because they don't think fetuses are persons and because they think her bodily autonomy trumps the fetus and because they think the consequences of outlawing abortion are untenable, etc. After all, Thompson uses parallel arguments in her paper. She talks about the violinist, but also about people's needs. We may as well say, you shouldn't even bring up the violinist because that's not your argument for why all abortions should be allowed. This other thing is. It wouldn't be giving her argument due consideration, and there's nothing that says she can only support a claim with one argument. The day after writing that response, I was thinking more about this question and something occurred to me. 
We often use the responsibility objection in response to what we call right to refuse arguments. It's a specific, it's the better category of bodily rights arguments that instead of saying that you can do whatever you want with anything inside your body, makes a more nuanced claim the way Thompson does in her paper. That says you can't necessarily do anything you want with your body, but you should at least have the right to refuse to have it be hooked up to someone else, like the violinist. So we often use the responsibility objection in response to when they make a right to refuse argument like the violinist. The responsibility objection basically says, here's a major problem with your analogy that unfairly tips the scales toward pro-choice because it treats all pregnant women like kidnapping victims. Let's not lose touch with the idea that there are sometimes consequences to our actions and we can't always walk away from those consequences without doing something seriously wrong. Given that context, it's pretty annoying to me if the pro-choice person then responds, hey, that's a red herring. You're also against abortion for other reasons. I'm like, dude, you put us on this track by comparing all pregnant women to kidnapping victims. I was just responding to that. Notice that when I explained why I'm pro-life earlier, I didn't say anything about responsibility. We saw a similar yet different accusation that the responsibility objection is a red herring, although this one was even less charitable. It came from a pro-choice person that one of our Equipped for Life course students talked to, who basically said that if a pro-life person uses the argument that when you have consensual sex, you're engaging in an act that might result in the creation of an inherently needy child that you owe compensation to, and that pro-life person is against abortion in the case of rape too, they should just own that they don't think responsibility has anything to do with it. Instead, they're just, quote, shaming women for having sex, end quote. I actually think it's pretty natural for a leftist who is on the alert for conservatives to say something that sounds like slut shaming to read that into this argument. So pro-life people should be extra careful when making this argument. This is where our dialogue tip of using the format, here's what I'm not saying and here's what I'm saying is very useful. You're predicting straw man responses ahead of time, whether or not the straw men are intentional or unintentional, and trying to deal with them before they mess up the conversation. After all, the other person basically can't be convinced by you if they think you're a sexist. Having said that, the slut-shaming accusation misses the point of the responsibility objection. As Rachel Crawford explained in the private Facebook group that you get access to by purchasing the Equip for Life course, link in the description, quote, So it is actually the pro-choice side that says pregnancy is something which requires consent and so women can say no. And I am coming in saying, actually, no. Pregnancy isn't an action like sex that needs consent but it is in a different category. It is a consequence. If you look closely at the responsibility objection, you'll see that we are not saying consent to sex is consent to pregnancy as our rebuttal. Instead, we are saying that when you consent to sex, you become responsible for the foreseeable consequences. Saying pregnancy is a foreseeable consequence of sex is not a moral judgment of the sexual act. It is a claim about the nature of the sex contract. In the same way, you can make a claim that in the sex contract, men consent to financial child support if she becomes pregnant. Finally, YouTube user Language Games one posted this critical comment that goes a different direction. He's basically saying that we're straw manning Judith Jarvis Thompson. Now, this is important because we are very opposed to straw manning pro-choice arguments. So let's, we want to make sure that we don't do that. So here's what he or she says. Thompson specifically says in her paper that most pregnancies do not arise in circumstances analogous to the violinist scenario. I think it's a bit disingenuous to present this disanalogy as if it were some hitherto unnoticed problem which you have perspicaciously spotted. The point of the argument is that if the basis for opposing choice is the right to life of the fetus, then the right to life of the violinist should prevent the kidnap victim from detaching herself from him. The whole point is that a right to life cannot depend on circumstances outside one's own control. An innocent person either has a right to life or they don't. If they do, then the violinist and the fetus have an equal right to life irrespective of how they came to be dependent on another person's body, in which case the responsibility objection is moot because responsibility has nothing to do with it. All right, first, a point of agreement. Thompson does note in her paper that the violinist situation wouldn't necessarily apply to all pregnancies, but I don't think that we're implying that she was unaware of this issue. And if it is coming across that way, it's unintentional. That's not the point that we're trying to make. Thompson's brilliant. Thompson is one of the smartest pro-choice philosophers in the last 50 years to argue about that. So that's not the point. Instead, we're trying to point out that this argument doesn't do what most pro-choice people think it does in 99% of pregnancies. Maybe it's not a flaw with the way Thompson intended for the violinist to be used, 
but is at least a flaw with the way most pro-choice people use the violinist story. That's why the video is called one of the violinist argument's biggest flaws. I can understand the confusion, though, so this is just a clarification about what we mean and what we don't mean. I also wanted to respond to one other thing Language Games once said. Quote, The point of the argument is that if the basis for opposing choice is the right to life of the fetus, then the right to life of the violinist should prevent the kidnapped victim from detaching herself from him. End quote. We don't think this is true. The right to life doesn't entail the right to any and all life-extending medical interventions. There are other differences between the violinist and abortion besides that it's not analogous in the vast majority of abortion cases, as Thompson notes. But again, mostly people trying to use her argument don't. These other differences, such as the fact that abortion always involves killing someone as opposed to merely not helping, account for why abortion is a violation of one's right to life. But the violinist scenario does not violate that right. If you'd like to learn more about responding to bodily autonomy arguments for abortion, I'll post some links in the description. Our most complete response is in the Equipped for Life course, where we explain several other problems with the violinist argument, some mistakes for pro-life people to avoid when responding, and several thought experiments that demonstrate that abortion is wrong and should be illegal, even though we agree that bodily autonomy is a real thing. I hope that helps, and if you'd like more content like this to help pro-life and pro-choice people have more productive dialogues with each other, then be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you'll be alerted when we post more videos like this. Thanks so much. Now go have important conversations. As if it were some hitherto unnoticed problem, which you have perspicacious. I don't even know how to pronounce that. What is that? Perspicacious. Perspicacious. Perspicaciously. Man. As if it were some hitherto unnoticed problem, which you have perspicacious. Perspicacusly, per, pers, perspicacusly.